At first glance, the Sony a7R5 might look almost identical to the Sony a7 IV, but there's so much more going on under the hood. And since my time was extremely limited with this camera, I decided to solely focus on the photography capabilities since it is a stills first video second camera anyways. Image quality. So I've been shooting JPEGs with the Sony a7R5 for the past two and a half weeks because there isn't a way to open the raw files at this point. And what's interesting is that I found something about the a7R5 that makes it probably the best portrait photography camera that Sony has ever made. And it's not all about the megapixels or the autofocus. Now, speaking of the megapixels, it's got the same 61 megapixel BSI center of the Sony a7R4. Whether you think that's a good or bad thing, it's just what I've noticed is that center tech innovation has stagnated across the board. And we are gonna see this strategy more in the future. But personally, I don't think the demand for increasing the resolution was there anyways, or at least from what I can see on the internet. More importantly, however, what they did do was beef up the processing by including two Bion's XR processors, making it a much better hybrid camera than the a7R4. And some of the shoots that I did with the a7R5, I directly compared the files to my current workhorse, the 50 megapixel Sony A1, the JPEGs, of course. And I couldn't see any visible difference in the overall sharpness, even at 200%. But what I did notice was how much better the colors are when shooting in the studio. Actually, I think it has more to do with the white balance improvement that they've done to the Sony a7R5, which Sony mentions is an added benefit from the autofocus AI chip they put in here. So there have been some times in the past where I'm shooting in the studio and I've actually had to switch to my Canon R5 or R3 because I wasn't getting the skin tones that I wanted in camera. I would get this yellow tint in the skin and I'm sure many of you have experienced this. Matter of fact, I know you have because I've gotten emails from you asking what you should do. This is not something you might notice unless you're actually comparing it to the files of another camera. With the a7R5, I was not getting this yellow cast in the skin. And what I did was take a bunch of photos of my mannequin with each camera in auto white balance so I could show you, so you could see for yourself the difference and what I'm talking about. The reason why this is so important to me is because, well, when I'm using my Canon and my Nikon cameras, Z9, R5, I can shoot those cameras in auto white balance and get great skin tones whether I'm shooting natural light, off camera flash, in auto white balance. I, I never have to pull out a gray card. And with the Sonys, I wanna be able to just shoot auto white balance as well. It's one less thing to remember. Guys, I have ADHD. I'm constantly, I wanna keep my process as simple as possible. I don't wanna always have to remember to use a gray card. I'm not a robot. I forget all the time. And if I can get better straight out of camera skin tones on the a7R5, I think that is something that no one should overlook. I think for any portrait photographer out there, whether you use a great card or not, I think it is a pretty big deal because there's always been that color science debate on what camera puts out uh, more pleasing colors. And, and a lot of the times we're basing that off of auto white balance, what the camera leans towards without it finding or it knowing what neutral gray is. So to me, that is one huge benefit of the a7R5. One of the biggest reasons why I didn't use the Sony a7R4 is because I didn't want or need 61 megapixels. It didn't give you an option to reduce the resolution in camera. With the most recent update on the Sony A1, I'm able to shoot in small, medium, and large lossless compressions if I didn't want that 50 megapixel file size. On the A7R5, you can do the same. And the lossless are about 40 megabytes allowing you to get raw files pretty close to the size of a compressed a7r4 file and in my opinion that makes it so much more versatile than the sony a7r4 speaking of versatile have you checked out my lightroom presets my golden hour presets will make your backlit images pop and even the ones where you just want to add a little bit of a warmer tone to 
the Walmart Drake preset pack is my go-to for those urban portraits, and my film pack will give you those rich filmic skin tones. Check them out in the link below. Autofocus. Now, I feel like I needed much more time with the autofocus to learn its quirks, but from what I saw, it's a pretty big improvement for Sony users, but because I also use Canon, I found that it behaves very, very similarly to the Canon R3, but to be fair, this is a high-end sports camera. The a7R5 has an AI-based autofocus using deep learning with its own dedicated chip. It can now do what Sony calls real-time recognition autofocus that now tracks humans, animals, insects, cars, trains, and airplanes. The thing that makes this so special is what they call human pose estimation, where it's able to recognize different parts of the body and track a person when their eyes are not visible, even when someone is passing in front of the camera. You're able to achieve this by changing your tracking sensitivity to locked on so that it will stick to your subject as best as possible. So I tried to do the same thing on the Sony A1 with focus tracking on locked on. And as you can see, it isn't as consistent. Another huge difference between these focusing systems is how with the Sony a7R5, you can tell the camera which face you want to focus on. And with the A1, it will also detect if there are multiple faces in the frame and put boxes on them, but there just isn't a way to specifically choose which one you want to track. Everything else about this autofocusing system is improved. Like even the real-time eye autofocus, it'll track the eye from further and will hold on to it even longer when let's say someone is in the process of turning around. But I think the biggest upside to this new autofocus system is the ability to detect and toggle from different faces in a scene by just flicking your joystick up. So for example, you can be using medium spot autofocus and without having to change autofocusing modes, you can push up on a joystick. It'll switch to face select mode. And now you can choose by just moving your joystick which person you want the camera to track. Now, if you want to cancel out of that, you can just press the middle button and it'll go back to medium spot autofocus. No other camera that I've ever used allows for that much versatility when trying to get your shot. My only two complaints with the autofocus being a Canon and Nikon user, I wish that using eye autofocus, I could switch the eye that the camera is focusing on by just simply flicking the joystick instead of having to map a custom button to, to do that. I also wish that the autofocus would work a little bit more like the Canon R3 and be able to recognize all different kinds of objects and put boxes around them, not just humans or animals, but just anything. But I may be asking for too much. I just, it's something that I'm used to when I'm using the R3. Ergonomics. If you're someone that spends any time behind the camera, I think that we can agree that having a regular tilty screen is better than having a flip out screen because this is good for getting your line straight in camera and it's much faster to open up if you're gonna shoot from a lower angle. Again, there's a lot of advantages to having a tilty screen. The problem is that the flippy screen is much more useful for so many other things. So they kind of merged and put these two things together does add a lot more bulk to the camera. You definitely can feel it, but I think people are not going to care. I know I don't care. What's exciting about this is it gives us a little peek into what future cameras are going to have on their camera bodies. Why do I keep looking at this camera like it has it? It doesn't. This is the A1, but the screen is phenomenal. The Sony a7R5 now features an eight stop IBIS mechanism, which is almost, it's hard to even try to comprehend, right? A couple years ago when Nikon started coming out with their mirrorless cameras and Canon, they, you know, they bragged about their big mount and we just assumed that Sony's smaller mount, its IBIS was limited. And I thought, okay, well, it's one of the downsides to having a full frame Sony camera mount small. We're not gonna have great IBIS, but I don't know what they did with the algorithms, but 
I was sitting at my home office with the 100 millimeter macro lens and I was taking pictures of my one a day vitamin gummies on my desk. I put the 100 millimeter on my A1 and on the A7R5 and at a half a second long shutter, I was getting sharp results with 100 millimeter 2.8 on the A7R5 when compared to the A1, it was completely blurry. It didn't make sense to me. I wish I had more time again. Sony just kind of took the camera away from me a little too early. But from what I saw there, I was like, whoa. So I'm going to be watching other people's videos to see how good it really is. The Sony a7R5 features a 9.44 million dot EVF. So this is a bump over the a7 IV. It's very similar to the one in the A1, if not the same. And let me tell you, when you use a camera that has such a large, clear electronic viewfinder, it's really hard to go back to anything else. Like when I pick up my A7 IV after using my A1 or the R5, it's almost like my vision is being restricted. It's, it makes a big difference once you go move up to these really big, clear EVFs. You have to see it for yourself, but um, it's big and beautiful. That's all I can say. The Sony a7R5 now has a new tile menu, very similar to the one in the FX3 and the FX30. This is 100% an underrated improvement. Honestly, I liked it more and more as I was using the camera. It definitely fixes an issue with menu diving, right? So people have complained in the past that, you know, they have to dig through the menus to change one thing. This fixes that because the tile menu has so many of the things that you would need. Let's say you want to change your picture profile. Um, you want to format your card. You don't have to go into the actual menus. It's all going to be right there in that tile menu. The nice thing about the tile menu is that you don't have to use that. You can just scroll down one and you can have the original menu system that all the latest Sony cameras have. I'm not going to lie. This camera checks all the boxes for me as a portrait photographer and content creator. More than any other camera, honestly, like I said in my other videos, the Sony A1 is my go-to camera for, any, for almost anything. But if I had to just use one camera for everything, that includes filming myself and for photography, I'd probably go with the A7 IV and sacrifice all the amazing capabilities of the Sony A1 just to have a flip screen. That's how important it is for someone like me. I do have a few reservations, however. One of them is that I love having the 1400 flash scene speed on the A1 when shooting in the studio when I'm trying to avoid using high speed sync. I'm also used to the Sony A1 and how fast and responsive it is. I kind of feel slowed down when I'm using the Sony A7R5. On the other end, the improved color, white balance, when using flash would be probably the biggest reason why I would want to switch to the A7R5. Um, I do think that the new AI autofocus is a major upgrade, but I do feel like it would be more, a more meaningful upgrade on an A9, A1 series of camera. So I know that there was much more that I wasn't able to cover on this camera, but again, my time was cut short with it and I low key kind of feel bad. I wish I could have done more coverage on this camera, but I do feel that the stuff, the things that I pointed out in this video, like the more accurate color. And I feel like that's an important thing to bring up because a lot of people are not gonna talk about that because it, it just falls into my niche. I'm definitely not trying to overhype anything, but this is such a big deal to me and anyone out there that deals with humans with people, I'm telling you, as a Canon and Nikon shooter, this is something that has, you know, always kind of plagued me. It's, a, it's really nice to see. So when I get the camera back, I'm gonna be using it for the next, how many months until the next one comes out. And I'm gonna continue to talk about this. And um, yeah, it's important. But uh, more coverage on this camera soon, as soon as they send it back to me. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you guys later.